Okay. So wait a second. Okay. <coughs> so that's as always is our veil chamber picture. We had our anosov element here and not. <coughs> we already showed that every element here is an anosov element. And using that, we show that if we have your lift of the conjugacy to R3, and we write this as H1 tilde plus H2 tilde plus H3 tilde with respect to this splitting into the first, the second, and the third eigendirection, we were able to prove that H1 tilde is That was our painful last talk, okay? And why H1 tilde? Because we were able to move toward this boundary here of this veil chamber C. <coughs> and as we have said, we could have go to this kernel of chi 2 and prove that H2 tilde is also smooth. That's fine, you can do it, it's not a problem, but what we are looking for is for the H3. But for the H3, we want to continue our argument. We need to go all the way up to this kernel. And to go to this kernel, we need an of element here. Okay, and that's what we are going to do. We are going to find one of element there, an N1. <coughs> and the advantage is that now we know who is H1 tilde. Okay, so let me repeat one picture we have used yesterday but now it will become even more important. So, H tilde of the stable manifold of X is always equal to H tilde of X plus the stable space for the row and not, which is nothing but H tilde of X plus this E1 as E2, because the N naught is down here, so the stable guy are the first two <coughs> elements. And the H tilde of the unstable manifold, N naught of X, is H tilde of X plus EU rho N naught. <coughs> so this is the stable manifold for the linear action. It's the translate of the stable space, and this is the translate of the unstable space, which and this is H tilde X plus E3. Okay, so that's what we have. Now, <coughs> this has implications on what is this H1, H2, H3. So, this is the E1 direction, this is the E2 direction, this is the EC3 direction. If you have H tilde X here, it has this value here, H3 tilde of X, and then it has this other value here, H2 tilde of X, and this other value here, H1 tilde of X. Okay, and what we are saying here <coughs> is there is two important implications of this equality. Is one that you have that this guy is contained here, and the other is that this guy is equal to this. It's not just contained, it's completely equal. So it's an onto map when you restrict to this unstable manifold. And the same for the second statement. So it means that when I take a point here, take its unstable of X, take the stable manifold of X, Of course, you have to lift everything to the universal cover to apply the H tilde. If not, you apply the H. This guy, this line is mapped into this vertical line here. Okay, so that's what says this second statement. So this is not a line, it's a curve, but still it goes on to this vertical line. And it means that <coughs> the H1 coordinate is constant. The H2 coordinate is constant, 
but in the H3 coordinate, you are onto. Okay, so I have that. This expression here means H1 tilde of the unstable manifold, or let's maybe put it this way, of Y is H1 tilde of X for every Y in the unstable manifold of X, alpha naught always, so I'm not moving alpha naught. Similar thing. And finally, H3 tilde restricted to the unstable manifold is a homomorphism. So this maps of the Y tilde X naught into the E3 space. The Helder continues homo, with Helder continuous inverse. Okay. <coughs> and similar thing I can say up here. Okay, from here I get that H3 restricted to the stable manifold alpha n naught of X. Um, I should make the H1 tilde plus H2 tilde from stable manifold alpha n naught of X into E1 plus E2 is a homeo. And H3 tilde of Y is H3 tilde of X for every Y in the stable manifold alpha n naught. So all this is an exercise, so you can do it by yourself. Okay? You have all these nice properties. <coughs> okay. Now here, observe there is some asymmetry here. So uh, here I have this H3 along the unstable, and it's one dimensional going to one dimensional. And here I have to put H1 plus H2. And I cannot speak directly just of H1. And the problem is because I don't have a splitting of the stable manifold into one dimensional. I have a splitting for the linear, but not, I don't have a splitting for the nonlinear. If I had a splitting, I would expect exactly that I can then split the, these two businesses, so to have a, a foliation attached to one and another foliation attached to the other. In principle, yeah, you don't know really, so even if you have the splitting, you have to prove something. It's not that it's for free. And even more, here because you have the whole action, but if you are just with one individual system, let me maybe, it's just an important, a very important observation. So if you just have one guy, this is the perturbation of an, an also of linear map, three real eigenvalues, then you will have that the tangent to T3 split as ES, the strong direction, plus a weak direction. Say, if we are in this setting, like a weak stable direction, plus a unstable direction. So you will have this splitting there if you are only doing perturbations. But this, and you have the conjugacy, because with one and also you already have the conjugacy, and you will have a strong stable foliation, a weak stable foliation, and unstable foliation. So all these things you will have. Now this foliation will be mapped by the conjugacy to the unstable foliation, that's easy. These two guys join integrate to the stable foliation and it's going to the stable foliation for the linear. This weak foliation is a little bit harder to prove, but you can prove. This weak foliation will go to the sent to the intermediate foliation for the linear, but the strong foliation will essentially never go to the strong foliation of the linear. So unless you have some very specific type of system, the strong foliation is not going to the strong foliation. So these things in general do not happen. Strong foliations don't go to strong foliation. 
Is a perturbation, so it's because it's a perturbation of the linear. So it's, 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 it's here to show theory, yes. Yes, so it's, it's, it's just a perturbation. So yeah. yeah, if it is not a perturbation, then in, still in this type of setting, a lot of things are known, but, but if it is a perturbation, it's, it's this all here to show theory. So it's, you can just write out formulas and, 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 and produce it. <laughs> so, so yeah, even, so according to this, even if we can split this, it's, it's not at all obvious that the corresponding foliation will go to the corresponding foliation. But it will be true. So we, we, if, if the sugar is smooth, this will happen. And we are trying to prove this. Okay, and I already know that this H1 tilde is smooth. Okay, so let's move the next step. So I need, I have only these two bundles and I need to jump into the next place. And in the next place, I need to find another two bundles, okay? So the way it should be is just, you need to follow the, the recommendation of the linear so if I take this N1 there, so the stable for this N1 will be just the E2 direction, and the unstable for the N1 will be the E1 plus the E3. Okay, that's for the linear. Now I have to produce something similar to the nonlinear. Now, the E3 corresponds to the unstable in the N0 case, so this N0 will still be so this E3 corresponding direction will still be in the unstable for the N1. So I have one piece of unstable for the N1. Okay? Now I, <coughs> I want to produce the E2. Okay? Which is this table. But it will not be easy to produce this E2. And then I want to also to produce the E1. So, and I have just this H1. So let, let, let me just tell you what you do. Well, you have this linear map. So one observation before, one more property for this H1 map. So if you write an integer in C3, so take this integer in C3, you can write it as N1 plus N2 plus N3, where the Ni are in the EI, and the fact that the H tilde X is a map that goes to the torus, it will give you that this H1 tilde of X plus an integer is the same as H1 tilde of X plus this N1. Okay, if you look at what happens in the integer translate, it's just doing that, so it's not doing more than that. Okay, so let's define some subspace by f of x is the kernel of the h1 tilde. Okay, this is for x. <coughs> in R3. I just have this kernel. So what are the properties of this f of x? Property 1 n is in C3, then f of x plus n is f of x. Okay, so this is just an application of this property here. <coughs> so it really, this f of x, so f of x defines vector space. Vector bundle, it's not exactly a vector bundle, so, but it's on the torus T3. Okay, because it's independent of the choice of the guy. You take a point in the torus T3, you take an element of F3 that project to it, and I have this vector space. Okay, and if I take another guy, I have the same vector space, so it's well defined on the torus. So that's the first thing. The second thing follows from the property <coughs> of the H tilde, so since 
H1 tilde composed with F is rho n composed H1 tilde. Okay, so it's only for the first piece, but it's still, if you want, you can even put here e to the chi 1 n times this. So this implies f is alpha n, I'm sorry, for every n square. This implies <coughs> that d alpha n of f of x is f alpha n of x. <coughs> okay, it's an invariant, so to speak, bundle. Okay, so I have a new invariant bundle. That's all I wanted. So what is this kernel? So you, you always have to imagine this H1 tilde as the projection onto the first coordinate. Because that's what it is. It's projection plus some periodic guy. So it's, it looks really like projection. So this kernel, in the nicest case, will be giving you this E2 plus E3 direction. Okay, this f, you, can, you have to think this f as the e2 plus e3. Of course, e2 plus e3 is useless. So I want to have something like e2 or something like e1 plus e3, not e2 plus e3. But that's, that's what you get, what to do. So you, you use what you get. You, you don't just produce what you want. So you just get something, you use something. <coughs> so that's what we get. Okay, so now I can... a couple of lemmas. Lemma one is mention f of x is two for every x in torus T3 and hence f of x is a continuous bundle. Okay, so it's just some, so the, the first statement is not trivial, the second statement is just some trivial application of implicit function theorem. Okay, so this kernel is the tangent space to the solution to the level surface of the h1 equals to constant. But I need to know that these guys are two-dimensional. This guy could be three-dimensional. It could even be three-dimensional at every single point. Could it be? Jura. So if you have a function from R3 to R, and the kernel of the derivative is everything for every single point, what you can say? First of all, you have a linear map from R3 to R, and the kernel of the linear map is everything. What you can say about the linear map? That's easy. Zero. Exactly. Now, if I know the kernel of the derivative is everything for every single point, I know that the derivative is zero for every single point. What can I say about the function whose derivative is zero at every single point? Constant. Can H1 tilde be constant? was somewhere here. Yes, well, something like this, essentially. Maybe this one? Yeah, this one will, will do that for us. Thanks. Yes, it cannot be constant. Indeed, it's projection plus bounded, so could, how could it be constant? So the, the bounded should kill the projection, and a bounded guy cannot kill a projection. This is projection plus periodic, not only bounded, periodic is bounded. So it cannot be constant. <laughs> okay, now next question. What does Sartre's theorem tell me? That almost every point is a regular point. Regular means exactly this kernel is minimal possible. Okay? So, I know that this guy has dimension two a lot of times. But that's something to start. So at least I can play with something. So I want for every point, but I got a lot. 
open, at least, because certainly it will be an open property to have kernel 2. Start here and tell me some regular points, plus I have this property here. Or if you want, <coughs> yes, this property here. So this f of x is invariant. So, so proof of lemma. Let k be a set of points x such that dimension of f of x is 3. So this dimension could be just 2 or 3. There is no room for anything else. OK? So property 1, k is compact. Property 2, alpha n of k is k for every n. So it's invariant by the whole action. We have a compact invariant set by the whole action. Okay? This almost killed this. It's, it's, you are so close when you get this. There is a result by Berend. It will be useless for us, but still I think it's worth stating it. is essentially the Fustenberg, the counterpart of, 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 of Fustenberg times two times three for compact invariant set that Amir was talking about a couple of days ago, which says that if rho n, so for the linear of k is equals to k for every n in C square, k compact, then either k equals to the total space. That's good. We already rule out k being the total space. k is empty. That's good. We want to show it is empty. Three, one, two, three, k is finite. And since it is invariant, it's just finitely many periodic orbits. Okay, the problem is that Beren doesn't rule out k finite because he cannot. So you have compact invariant sets which are finite, so you have finite orbits. And having a finite orbit where this phase is not useful for us. And it's not even just not useful, it's useless if you want to look at the generalization to higher dimensions. So there is no Beren theorem in higher dimensions. And it may fail in a very bad way. So it's, it's yeah, quite bad. There are some results by Siren Wan and, and Elon Lindenstrauss about uh, how these things can fail for nil manifolds. And so it's, 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 it's complicated. Okay. But even if it were just a periodic point, so it's, it's we need to do something about this periodic point. So I, I will still use the theorem just to make my life simpler in the exposition because I only need to assume the case just some periodic orbit, so some amount of periodic orbits. In the general setting, what you do is you, you have a compact invariant set. It supports a measure. And you play with the measure instead of the periodic orbit. And then instead of using stable and unstable manifolds for periodic points, you use passing theory with respect to the invariant measure. So not harm. It's OK. But anyway, here you have parent. <coughs> so still, we, we know something about this compact set. Now we can do something about it. OK. gamma equals to the stabilizer of P. So all the n such that alpha n is of P. Yeah, that's it. And we know we have already discussed this. We have always that this gamma is finite index. So we can assume always the point is fully fixed okay, for all the elements of the action. 
Or maybe I didn't comment that, but. So this theorem is for the linear action. But since the linear and nonlinear are topologically conjugate, the same is true for the alpha action. So it's, it's, it's a property which is invariant by topological conjugacies. <coughs> okay, I take this P here, my fixed point, and I know that for this fixed point, I have Lyapunov exponents, and I know they almost match with the Lyapunov exponent for the linear. So it's match up to a constant, but that's good enough for me. So this point will have a E3 of P, E2 of P, E1 of P. This, this you have. And the stable manifold of P is this plane down here. Okay, so let me concentrate on this plane. E1 of P, E2 of P. <coughs> now, this plane is the stable manifold for the n naught guy for the point P. So it's mapped into the E1 plus E2 plane. So the H map this map plane to the other plane. And indeed, it's not just H, it's this H1 plus H2 tilde that are making this map. And of this, I know the H1 tilde, okay, is smooth, but has derivative zero here at this point. Okay, so the next statement Following. Huh? This strong, stable manifold. Okay. So something very similar to this. Okay, for this I need to pick my right element, my correct element, so I pick this guy here, let's call it N3. This, I'm picking a guy whose chi1, the upper of exponent is very close to zero. The chi2 is reasonably large. The chi3, who cares? Okay. So I know that for the guy I'm taking, so for this entry guy I'm taking, this is a strong contraction and this is just a weak contraction. And I can take this as close to zero as I want. This, and this will become huge indeed in this case. So there exists a foliation. The Lipschitz. Even a C1 foliation. F U U of stable the well if it is S is S S not U U of this guy. This fixed point, this is the same as the stable manifold alpha is not, so it's stable manifold doesn't change. Such that um, one alpha n and one in principle only, but also will be true for others. But I only need n one of the leaf y is alpha n one y. An invariant foliation, but it's only inside this stable manifold. It's not in the Abelian space. And one is this guy, N3. I'm sorry, N3, N3, you're right. And this is also N3, I'm sorry. You're right. N3 is the same, the same base chamber. Here, the, the condition on N3 is chi1 of N3 is negative and is much, much larger and closer to zero than the chi2. Okay. 
second, the tangent space at the point P of FSS at the point P is this E2 of P. So it's an almost vertical foliation. Also, you have that the third property is that FSS of X is transverse to this, well, I should put a name. So some, there is some center manifold here, WU, so WC of P. This, let me not write it so there. There is such a center manifold here. You, you can show it. This is a naturally well-defined center manifold. Let me not enter into this. Well, maybe I will have to enter into this because I want to say one more thing. Um, instead of calling it C, let me put a one just to emphasize the tangent to the first direction for H tilde of this W1 of P is H of P plus the E1 direction. So it's a guy that is mapped there. This W1 of P is a smooth manifold. You can see, I, I can tell you from here who is W1 of P. So I take a point here. Okay, if I take a point here, the E1 direction is the stable, and the other two guys are unstable. Okay, so the first direction is contracting. So if I take this point here, in this picture, I have E2 plus E3 is unstable, and E1 is the stable. So then it has a stable manifold for this other element. This stable manifold is exactly this W1P I'm taking. But I can say it only for the point P. I cannot say it for other points. It is fine. So I have this foliation. <coughs> it's a smooth foliation. Okay, now what happens with this smooth foliation? This is the very next step. So this is the smoothness comes because of very strong domination. So then you have, you can even make it CR. But Lipschitzness, which is the only thing I care, only comes just from this inequality plus the fact that this is one dimensional. And there you can get Lipschitz and even C1 plus Hölder. This is just some computation. But that's, only, that's the only thing you need. If you want more smoothness, then you need much more smaller. My action was infinity. I can do C1 plus alpha. But then I will need to play more. <laughs> Okay, now the next is the crucial lemma, which was what was not true there in this general case. It has to do with one more property that has this strong stable foliation that I will state soon. So let's say this is lemma one, that was lemma two. Lemma three, H tilde, which you only care about the one plus two, but still, of F S S of X is equal to the H tilde. Indeed, I only need the contain, but it's indeed equal to H uh, tilde, oops, yeah, H tilde of X plus this E2 direction for every x in the stable manifold of P for this alpha. So inside this strong stable manifold, I know that these guys are mapping where they have to map. And the proof of this lemma follows from the following addendum. Lemma two. Y is in the FSS of X, 
there exists an epsilon positive such that if and only if the distance alpha entry to the k of x alpha entry to the k of y decays faster than e to the uh, so it's sky 2 direction sky 2 of n3 plus epsilon so these strong stable are characterized by the strong speed of convergence okay and the point is that in this plane essentially you have two possible speeds the chi 2 speed or the chi 1 speed and in the linear, you also have only these two possible speed, the chi 2 speed or the chi 1 speed. So I should put a point, a, a P here, not a, because the chi 2 is just for the linear. Here is for the, the, the nonlinear chi 2. <coughs> there are some constants, but everything is fixed here. Now here comes a trick, and that's why I really need to, to, to finish the lemma 3. I need really this difference to be huge. Okay, I need this to be true here, and I also need this to be true for the points P, and I also need some theta Helder constant appearing in this inequality, because the point is that if I apply my conjugacy H to this inequality, and since the conjugacy H is Helder continuum, I just pay a times theta here. Okay, so since I pay a theta here, I know that the image of HX on HY are going to zero faster than what the chi 1 direction is telling me. So they need to be on the chi 2 direction, on the same chi 2. Okay? So that's the proof of the lemma. So I, as always, run out of time. So let me just say this about this proof. <coughs> so I have lemma 3 that sends the strong stable to the strong stable. Okay, now that's essentially the end of the proof. I take this box. Here. Color chalk, no, I never have color chalk. I never use color chalk neither, so it's not a problem. So it's this, this box here. And I map by H. This is mapped into some box where the verticals go to the vertical. Horizontal, this horizontal goes to this horizontal. Okay? Now, the sizes is this length is 1, and this length here is epsilon. Okay, so what's the area of this box here is epsilon, essentially. Okay, there are some constant because these are not vertical lines, these are just curves but it's essentially epsilon, okay? Now this box is mapped into something which has uniform length in the vertical, okay? So it's, the vertical is larger than, I can even make it larger than one half, but let's say some constant C naught. And what happens for this horizontal? <laughs> well, I have this segment here, and I'm applying H1 to this segment. Because if I restrict to the E1 direction, I'm just applying H1. I can't forget about the H2 direction and H3 direction, so these are zero. Now, H1 is smooth. Derivative of H1 at zero is zero. So what I get in this direction is an epsilon square, or smaller. So I'm mapping something of size epsilon to something of size constant times epsilon square. It's much smaller. Now, if you remember, I told you 100 years ago that there is a volume measure here, which is mapped by H to volume measure here. And this is not only true. What is true is that if I take these area measures along this table, it's mapped into area measure here, times a Jacobian, times a Radon-Nicodin derivative. But the Radon-Nicodin derivative is a continuous map. So if I have something of area epsilon here, it should go to something of area constant times epsilon, not constant times epsilon squared. So this is a contradiction. 
Okay? So this proved the derivative could not be zero. So I rule out. Proof my lemma one. I have my new band, my new band. As I told you, it's not the best bundle I wanted. I, what I wanted is the one plus E3 bundle, and what I got it was a bundle like the E2 plus E3. But that's all I need. <coughs> so, here, five minutes I should finish. <coughs> now with F, with this bundle F, I will take this guy now, and I show that this guy is an OSF. Okay, I need a criterion to claim that the guy is an OSF, and this is a theorem by Manier. Which says that f from m to m, if you only need c1, uh, and assume one mention of stable manifold of p equals to some constant S naught for any P inverse D of F. Of course, if there is no periodic point, it's even simpler for you. Uh, similarly, with, for the unstable manifold, so let me put a slash two. Uh, if periodic points are not hyperbolic, it's even better for you, so it doesn't matter. And second, for any B in the tangent of n for any x in m, you have that the supremum of the derivative. You take this vector, you go forward, go backward. This is infinity. This is called the quasi of property. Then F is an OSF. And the nice advantage of this criterion is you don't need to find any bundles, nor cones, nor nothing. Just need to take a vector and send it to infinity either for the future or for the past, or both, if you can, for both. OK, good. That's what I have to do. So the first is OK in my setting. So I take my alpha of n1, and I know that the Lyapunov exponents for this point is the same as for the linear for every point. So certainly then the dimension of the stables will be 1, and of the unstable will be 2 for every point. So the first property is not a problem. So I have to do the second. Take B, <coughs> X, B3, and assume first V is not in this bundle I just built. Okay, if it is not in this kernel, then what does it mean? Well, it means that then DH1 tilde x of b is a non-zero vector. But now I use the properties of the h. So h1 tilde compose alpha k n1 is equal to e to the k chi of n1 h1 tilde. So that's the property of the n1 tilde. And then if I take the derivative of this expression, so this on the alpha kn1 tilde uh, kn1 of x times the derivative of alpha kn1 tilde applied to the vector b. This is nothing but e to the k chi n1 derivative of x of h1 tilde of b. There is a k which is here. Now, k of n1 is positive. 
this guy goes to infinity, this guy is different from zero, this guy, the norm of this guy is uniformly bounded, this guy then, okay, so if, if the right hand side goes to infinity, the left hand side has to go to infinity. And the only way the left hand side is going to infinity is that this guy is going to infinity. Because this guy here is bounded. So H1 is a smooth map, so it's completely bounded. So that shows that for vectors which are not in this f of x, I'm fine. They go to infinity in the future, which is reasonable. <coughs> My f corresponded to the E2 plus E3. So a vector which is not in E2 plus E3 has an E1 coordinate. And a vector with an E1 coordinate should go to infinity. That's what is written there. So now I have to play with the vectors inside the f of x. But vectors with f, uh, inside the f of x are very easy to handle. f of x splits as what? As the f of x intersected with the stable manifold of alpha and not plus the unstable manifold of alpha and not. Okay, so it's the f corresponds to the E2, E3 direction Okay, so I can intersect this here, I intersect that there. So this, this is an exercise, so this requires a proof, but this is a quite straightforward proof, I hope. Okay, but now it's very easy. So I take a vector a, b in f of x, then either a, b is in the eu alpha and not of x, or let's say I can write b, maybe, maybe to, to write it more clear, uh, I can write B as a BS plus BU with respect to this splitting. So either BU is non-zero, in which case you come back here to your picture and see that the chi 3 direction didn't change at all. So it went from a plus to a plus. So this unstable bundle is still uniformly expanding after I cross this wall. So it will start having problem when I cross this wall, but it will not have any problem when I cross this wall. So I have this theorem that says that have uniform bounds there. So then there you are fine. So this implies D alpha KN3 of B is larger than D alpha KN3 of BU, which goes to infinity exponentially fast. Maybe some constant, but doesn't matter. So the second case is if BU is zero, then BS is not zero. Well, of course I should have said here. I don't want the zero vector there. <coughs> then the BS is not zero, and now I go backwards. So here is K went to plus infinity. Now here I take K going to minus infinity. And the point is that in this f intersection ES is this eigenvalue, this Lapin of exponent, which is directing the business, and this didn't change. So still I have uniform hyperbolicity along this direction. So same thing. Okay, so that's it. Let's finish the proof. Thanks.